live online for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. I'm Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher at Broadband Breakfast. I'm also of counsel at the Com Law Group, which deals with uh, broadband and telecommunications issues. And super excited to have a panel today talking about the Biden infrastructure plan and what it what it is, what it isn't, what it means, um, and uh, what's going to happen with it. So uh, before I get to our panel, uh, which we're again very excited to have uh, with us here today, I want to remind you that we at Broadband Breakfast uh, believe in better broadband, better lives. We cover broadband infrastructure, have for 13 years now, cover broadband application and use, have for 13 years now, cover the implications of broadband for issues like privacy, net neutrality, robocalling, et cetera. And uh, we, we invite you to learn more about us, uh, visit our website and um, share uh, this event and the email alerts that you uh, have the opportunity to sign up for on our website, twice weekly email alerts. This event, uh, as I say, is exciting because we're gonna talk about a very significant uh, proposal that just a week ago, the Biden administration put out there uh, but before we get to it, I do want to thank the sponsors of Broadband Breakfast, Utopia Fiber, the largest open access network in the United States, STL Network Services, which provides future-proof design, the right product, and on-time execution for your broadband project, and Broadband Now, which does research on social, economic, and political issues contributing to the digital divide and the impact of broadband in American life. Uh, next week, Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time, we'll be back. The title of this event today is Billions and Billions for Broadband. A little bit tongue in cheek, right? Because we're talking about $100 billion for broadband. Next week, we're going to be talking about less than a billion for broadband or, you know, your broadband project, what you need to do and how you can get financing for it. So that will be next week at 12 noon Eastern time. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn to our uh, panelists. I do ask if you are not a, a panelist to make sure to uh, keep your video off so that enables us to uh, you know, focus on the panel. We will get to a point in the program where um, you know, we hope you'll ask your questions and chat at any time, but if you really, really want to get on camera, just you know, send a, a chat message to me and we'll see if we can make that happen in the second half of the program. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up to all of our panelists. We're going to hear in this order uh, Gary Bolton, who is the CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association, the largest trade association dedicated to all fiber optic broadband. He'll be followed by Carrie Bennett. Uh, Carrie is the general counsel of the Rural Wireless Association and has worked with and represented small rural carriers for many years. Uh, Carrie will be followed by uh, Doug Brake, who directs the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation's work on broadband and spectrum policy. And batting cleanup will be uh, Matt Wood. We're very excited Matt can join us. Uh, he might've been with us uh, some years ago when we had our in-person broadband breakfast club events, but this is the first video appearance for him and we're glad to have him. He's the vice president of policy and general counsel at Free Press, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to you, Gary. Uh, and, um, you know, the floor is yours to say what you'd like to say about the uh, broadband plan of the Biden administration. Fantastic. Thanks, Drew. And as Drew said, I'm Gary Bolton. I'm the president and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association, and we're the largest trade association focused on all fiber broadband. Um, our association represents 350 members across the Americas that represent the full fiber ecosystem. About half our members are service providers of all sizes from Verizon and Google down to small rural incumbents, municipalities, rural electric co-ops and so forth. And then on the demand side, the other half organization is, includes um, engineering consultants, uh, elected public officials, optical fiber manufacturers like a Corning or OFS, optical equipment manufacturers like a Nokia, construction companies, financiers, fiber deployment specialists and so forth. You know, so last week, you know, it was a pretty exciting week. Um, so the White House invited me to a Zoom call to discuss the president's, the American Jobs Plan, which includes $100 billion to connect every American to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband over the next eight years. 
You know, the president's approach is to invest in future-proof, critical infrastructure and deliver long-term benefits. You know, we've seen firsthand the significant benefits uh, and the significant um, economic impact that fiber has when, com when it's deployed in communities. For example, in Chattanooga, we saw over a 4X return on investment in fiber. Their fiber project resulted in 9,500 new jobs for Chattanooga and $2.7 billion in positive economic impact. It also delivered smart grid modernization uh, where they saw that over 2 million customer interruptions were avoided. They had a 43% reduction in outage minutes. They had over about a billion dollars in benefit during major weather events. And we have tornadoes around here all the time. And also saw um, you know, power demand go down and electricity consumption um, go down because of more efficiency. So in addition to limitless broadband speeds, new jobs, economic development, smart grid modernization, Fiverr also delivers remote healthcare, online learning, public safety, and provides a path for future services like 5G. You know, the president's plan also prioritizes support for broadband networks owned, operated by, or affiliated with local governments, nonprofits, cooperatives, uh, you know, providers with less pressure to turn profits and with a commitment to serving the entire community. You know, in 2020, 88% um, of the fiber CapEx investment came from small providers such as rural operators, municipalities, and erected, uh, rural electric co-ops. You know, communities that have been left behind on the wrong side of the digital divide have been forced to step up and take matters in their own, in their own hands to get fiber to their citizens. So serving the entire community you know, versus cherry picking locations with you know, subscribers with high propensity spend, it's not really limited to governor, government entities. You know, we believe there are many incumbent operators that want to ensure everyone in their serving area gets fiber broadband service they deserve. You know, the plan also seeks to address broadband adoption by reducing the cost of internet, long, uh, internet service long-term. You know, it really pains me to see so much precious stimulus money going to subsidize ridiculously expensive, poor performing broadband service such as satellite in rural areas. You know, our nation is absolutely gonna be better served ensuring that fiber is deployed to all communities and we apply those funds towards subsidizing low cost, high performance gigabit services. So we have a long way to go before the you know, presence, the American job plan can become a reality but we believe the investment in fiber broadband will have a multi-generational positive impact for all Americans. And the Fiber Broadband Association will work tirelessly towards helping the administration gain bipartisan support for the broadband proposal in this plan. So I'll leave it at that and thanks, Drew. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Gary, we, we uh, uh, appreciate you uh, sticking to your time and, and uh, uh, giving us your, your perspectives. Let's go right into uh, Carrie to tell us about um, the Rural Wireless Association and your view about this proposal as we have it so far. Thank you, Drew, and thank you for having me on the show. Um, first of all, the Rural Wireless Association is, I, we're not the biggest trade association by any means. We're probably the smallest trade association by most means. Um, our members um, serve subscribers that are under 100,000. Um, so we like to graduate our, our members out of the association. Um, most of our Association members probably serve under 10,000 with a lot of them serving 200, some of them serving 10 subscribers. So we have a big range. We do mobile wireless, we do fixed wireless. Um, we use all sorts of spectrum in our toolkit. And all of this, um, th these wireless networks are connected to, to fiber at some point, somewhere. So fiber is very important. Uh, a lot of our members are also um, the rural um, wired broadband comp companies in their service areas and they've used wireless to extend beyond that. Um, turning to what we're excited about in, in um, Biden's um, American Jobs Plan is the idea, and, and this was a part of his campaign speech, was um, build back better. And we're seeing a way to put this infrastructure in, whether it's fiber or wireless, and it's not mentioned in the plan, which that would be, there's a mention of future proof. There's some, a lot of exciting things going on in the wireless world night right now that could future-proof networks, and that's using software and virtualized networks so that you don't have to change out hardware 
on antennas and, and towers anymore. I mean, on the, the antennas on towers anymore. You can use something called Open RAN. That's something that Mark Warner and the Intelligence and Intelligence Committee just introduced um, uh, a bill yesterday to fund that by three billion dollars um, to start getting that launched in the U.S. and opening that up for manufacturing in the U.S. So we're excited about that, and we think that could play into that. I think a lot of folks get really excited by the numbers. Drew, you seemed excited when you said billions and billions and billions, and we're talking about 100 billion. But if you notice what Gary mentioned is that's over an eight year period. So we're really only talking about 12 and a half billion a year. And when you think about what the Universal Service Fund is, that's 10 billion a year, roughly. Um, so we're not, it sounds like a lot of money when you when you add it all up, um, but over the time that we have to do this, it's it's not that much money in the long run. Um, so um, I, I just want to throw that out there because I think that's everyone gets hung up on the numbers. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is the, this idea of um, grants versus auctions. Again, it's not mentioned, but we've used reverse auctions to try to get funding out to serve these rural areas. And that seems to have been a race to the bottom. You don't get the superior technology. I think we had a big downfall, epic fail with the Ardoff auction. Um, and I think the F it's gonna be up to the FCC to write that ship um, so that we don't end up six years down the road still not having broadband built out to these areas because the companies that won a lot of money may not have the wherewithal to do it, whether it's technically or financially. Um, to support what they're trying to do. So there's some concerns there. I think the, the plan that Biden has put forward is looking more at you know, possibly um, putting, pushing the money down to the states and the local communities to decide where to spend the money and using a grant process. Interestingly enough, the FCC wasn't mentioned, NTIA wasn't mentioned. Um, but what I see is when I look at Congress, um, I see legislation that's already pending that looks like it amounts to almost $100 billion. So I think there's a lot of legislation that was introduced by, I'm sitting in the House side, by, by the Democrats that seem to like mirror what this plan is looking at. So I think if you looked at the LIFT Act and the um, legislation that Senator Klobuchar and um, Congressman Clyburn introduced, I think you'll see a lot of uh, what the plan might start to shape up to look like. But I will just, I'll, I'll stop and not use up any more time, but I just wanna say, I think this is just the start of the conversation. We have a lot more conversing to do and we're all gonna to have to do this together. It's, it's like the pandemic and COVID. It's like, if we all work together, we can get this done. And keep in mind that without broadband, you can't have economic development. And if we can get this stuff out to rural America, we can bring jobs to rural America. We can bring jobs back from overseas. We can really with broadband electricity and some sort of transportation nearby, we can bring all kinds of jobs back into rural America. So I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Thank you again, uh, Carrie, for your, your perspective. And now for a completely different perspective. No, seriously, we are really looking forward to Doug's comments on this. I, I want to say, you know, and just, just to kind of address a, a point briefly, it won't, won't, won't count against your time here, Doug. We, we try to get diversity of all types, diversity of viewpoints, diversity of of occupation and, and role, right? Diversity of backgrounds. And we don't always succeed. We, we, we keep trying and we appreciate your feedback. And, we, and if you uh, think you can offer something to a program, please let us know, email us. It's all on our site, broadbandbreakfast.com. But, but, but the reason I mention that is because, you know, I'm sure I'll hear from people saying, oh, you could have a bunch of lawyers and policy wonks on. You don't have any operators. Well, true, but we have operators on other programs, right? We have different people of different perspectives as, as much as possible. And, and we do welcome that. And so Doug, with that introduction, please tell us a little bit about ITIF, who you are and your take on what we've seen so far from this approach. Sure. Thanks so much, Drew. Thanks for having me. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, so I, uh, I'm i the Director of Broadband Spectrum Policy at ITIF. We're um, a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C. We focus on policies that we think advance innovation, especially innovation as it affects productivity growth and grows the economy uh, is really what we care about. Um, so clearly, you know, broadband is a, is a central uh, core policy area for but that's where we're uh, I want to be clear up front. I, I think it's absolutely tremendous that this infrastructure proposal is out there that would spend a significant amount of money uh, towards uh, uh, closing the digital divide. Uh, you know, some towards towards rural broadband infrastructure, also important to ensure that the broadband is portable for everyone. There's incredible benefits 
to getting everyone online, uh, to creating a system where it's like everyone can operate with the assumption that everyone else is online. And there's absolutely strong government justifications in, in spending this money to, uh, to close both the market failure in rural areas where the population density just doesn't justify investment from private, uh, private providers uh, or the important social uh, safety net that can be provided by um, ensuring broadband is affordable for everyone. At the same time, I gotta say, I think that there are some areas within at least this initial fact sheet that we saw from the Biden administration that seems to be pointing in the wrong direction. Uh, I wanna see uh, efforts uh, built in upfront to make sure that the funds for, particularly for rural broadband, uh, are both cost effective and well targeted, right? We're talking about a lot of money, but we're not talking about unlimited money. And so I think it you know, would really uh, pay dividends to, to, to think through upfront exactly how we want to target, target this money. And then if we spend you know, a significant chunk of, uh, if it's 100 billion or you know, 50, somewhere in between, uh, uh, that we can very nicely complement our existing system of private competition that works incredibly well for those areas where the population density is sufficient to support the investment needed, uh, but then but then have the government take over the uh, subsidies for for those rural areas where where it just doesn't make sense for for private competition to fill in. Uh, so, so my sort of top line summary of kind of where I, I, and I should say we put out not too long ago, a, a report uh, kind of trying to lay out our own proposal on how to tackle this issue of, of rural broadband infrastructure. So in a, you know, uh, in a nutshell, I think we have to award funds, a significant amount of funds, it's gonna take a lot of money, but we have to award those funds through a reverse or, or a procurement auction. We should aim for 98% coverage with terrestrial broadband, not 100%. Those last 2%, the costs really take off like a hockey stick. So I, I think, you know, be reasonable in what we're, what we're aiming for and do so through true technology neutrality, right? Have some flexibility for, for different kinds of technology to, uh, to fill in where there's, you know, extreme topography or, or mountainous regions, uh, you know, get providers the flexibility for different geographic areas. Um, we also need to avoid overbuilding existing networks, right? Where, there, where private capital has already been invested and where they can recoup that investment uh, and there's, there's already service provided, I think it makes sense to, to draw that line pretty firmly. We should also aim to achieve reasonable expectations of speed requirements, which means no need for symmetrical requirements or special satisfies for gigabit tier networks. I think if we follow these guidelines, honestly, we can more or less permanently solve the rural digital divide. There's always going to be a need for uh, for sort of um, filling in gaps and, and things like that. And, and, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe technology will, will you know, take off and will really need significant um, additional speeds. But I think that even at relatively modest or, or allowing for flexibility on the provider side uh, to provide uh, broadband, even if it's a relatively modest speeds, uh, we can, we can uh, really take a, a big chunk of this uh, rural infrastructure problem off the table if we focus on spending on the upfront capital expense rather than sort of ongoing incremental uh, programs that, that we've uh, really tried to date. Um, so I don't know, a, a, a few additional points. I think um, uh, I, there are also a few, a few indications in the... Uh, in the Biden infrastructure uh, proposal, at least the fact sheet that we have so far, right? There's a, it, you know, could go so many different directions depending on how the details all come out. Um, but I do think it's somewhat concerning this idea that uh, the funds would be prioritized for municipal uh, broadband deployments. Uh, we really need to leverage our private providers, particularly private providers that, um, that have large economies of scale. A lot of the remaining uh, unserved locations are going to be uh, in uh, census blocks that other areas in the census blocks are served. And so this, we're often talking about, you know, stringing networks down, you know, a, a few more miles down the road, uh, getting out to rural areas. And so scaling existing networks, I think is tremendously important. Uh, rather than trying to rely on municipalities, uh, you know, municipalities and co-ops, they definitely have a role, right? They have a, um, a great gap filling role. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think they should be the sort of primary target um, for, for this funding. They don't scale well outside of the jurisdiction. They don't invest in R&D uh, to develop new access technologies. They don't contribute to standards. Uh, like I said, they're good gap fillers, um, especially where there's only a single provider of slow speeds, but otherwise they don't uh, scale particularly well. Um, I should also, you know, uh, 
I know I'm running short on time, but I should also note uh, it's uh, uh, relatively concerning in the initial proposal, at least a hint towards a possible push for, for price controls. We're waiting to see the details, but, but it uh, certainly is troubling. There are real costs for buying these networks, and those costs have to be recouped over time. Price controls, I don't think, are a very good way of, of tackling the issue of affordability. With that, I'll turn it back to Drew. Thanks so much. Okay, awesome. Thank you again, Doug, for uh, being a part of our discussion, and we look forward to some, some good interaction here. Let's turn it over to you, Matt, uh, for your reaction uh, and your perspective on the, the plan as we see it thus far. Okay, can you hear me? I got the, yeah. okay, the double one meeting. Unmute myself. There we go. Thanks so much, Drew, for having me back. I think, yeah, it's hard to remember. I feel like it was about a decade ago and very glad to be here. Um, I think there's a lot of agreement here, you know, despite Doug raising some concerns about how the plan looks and, you know, obviously it's, it's a, to our view, brilliant beginning, um, but there aren't a lot of details in the fact sheet that came out last week. And I'm glad Carrie mentioned the congressional vehicles that are moving. There seems like a, to be a lot of harmony, at least on the democratic side of the aisle and a lot of agreement that we need to invest in these essential services. So what I appreciate about ITIF, you know, we spar with a lot of groups who we sometimes oppose on these issues and from different parts and different industries. And I do think, at least if I can speak for a second about ITIF, they recognize the need to invest in broadband, public and private. And there are definitely gaps to fill here. And that's what this is all about is getting that right. So I think at a high level, we have a lot of agreement and, you know, obviously we're gonna squabble about some of the details. That's kind of what we do here in DC. Um, but, you know, this is recognizing what I think it's almost a cliche for me to talk about the cliche anymore, but what I've said often and what we've seen is if there was any question before the pandemic that broadband was an essential service, it's been answered. You know, that debate is over. There is no complaining anymore. There is no question that this is something that everybody in, in the United States needs access to. And what I really want to talk about is needs to be able to afford, you know, that's really been our viewpoint and our take and I hope addition to this conversation over several iterations of this conversation for the last five and ten years, even longer than that perhaps, but even in this pandemic response mode and infrastructure mode, is we want to talk about affordability and adoption. And we've done that in the mapping context. We've done it here. And I think that's why this plan is so exciting to us is that like the emergency broadband benefit that we saw passed in the December stimulus bill, <coughs> like the uh, focus on affordability and adoption that is also part of the Clyburn Klobuchar vehicle and the Lift America Act and, you know, additional funding for the emergency broadband benefit, extending that out. That's really what we see as key. Uh, you know, I'll date myself and reference Field of Dreams, but as we said in testimony in a, in a hearing a couple of years ago, this is not if you build it, they will come. If we build fabulous networks in rural areas and have fabulous networks in urban areas and people can't afford to get online, they will not do that, and that shouldn't be good enough for us from an infrastructure standpoint is to build things that people ultimately can't use. I'm glad you mentioned, Drew, the diversity in all respects point. You know, I think that's incredibly important. I know how hard you're trying to do that. I will say, because I want to talk about the racial justice implications here, this is a very white panel to talk about broadband. We should have people from D.C. who work on these issues and come from these impacted communities here, and we should have people who are working in community on the ground with you know grassroots groups and with community activists to talk about this emergency broadband benefit and to really make sure that it is known to people who need to take advantage of it and widely available and you know really the success it needs to be to make sure people get online because that's what our research has shown you know we talk about affordability clearly the digital divide is about income we've seen rates rising faster than the rate of inflation for broadband over the last three years is what we tracked uh, when we testified just last month or two months ago now in Congress. Um, but, you know, it's not just about income. There's a persistent racial and ethnic component to the digital divide. If you look at the census data and those numbers. And so what we've said is we think roughly 77 million people, bare minimum, do not have access to or do not have the adoption of what we would call adequate broadband. We're not putting a threshold on that. I'm not here to talk about 25.3 or 100.100 or a gigabit. Um, as much as some of my public interest colleagues will do, and I'm sure we can talk more about the speeds and some of the questions I already see in the chat about what adequate speeds mean and what technology neutrality really gets us. But whatever speeds people can get, we need to make sure they get online and aren't left either solely relying on mobile, as good as mobile technology is and as necessary as it is, it's not a full substitute for wired broadband, or that they're not left completely without and so some of the numbers we've developed is, um, you know, again, income for sure, 84% of people in the top income quintile are connected to wired broadband today. 
but only 65% of people in the bottom income quintile are connected at all. And only 48% of those have a wired connection. That's the kind of disparity we see based on income. You know, this is not just a rural or just an urban problem. We look at the, the census identifications that people provide in the 2019 CPS computer and internet supplement. That's where a lot of our data is coming from. And there we see that while 26% of census identified non-Hispanic whites lack a wired broadband connection at home, that figure is 34% for black people, 35% for Latinx people and 41% for indigenous people. So that's really where I wanna you know, not stop and I'm happy to continue the conversation, but to say that at Free Press, we are not as worried about speeds alone. We're worried about speed and future proofing and affordability and adoption and in ways that are equitable for every population and every community and every demographic. And that's why we're so uh, again, excited about the broadband plan coming from Biden and from Congress too, because we really do think that it's infrastructure, it's about build out, but it is about this entire suite of solutions that we need to bring to this point. And I, I do wanna talk about one thing before I, I'm also running out of time here, if I haven't already uh, gone a little bit over. On the price controls point that Doug brought up, I do think that's a live and legitimate debate. I will say that what I see in the Biden plan is not discussion of price controls, but just the suggestion that we have to invest in broadband infrastructure deployment and adoption. You know, Free Press, and I wanna say it was instrumental, but along with so many others in getting the emergency broadband benefit, not just passed, but into the shape that it took, which was a very flexible benefit of giving people money and the ability to choose to apply that to any plan and not setting any kind of speed threshold for that. Um, we think that's the right approach. What I see in the Biden plan, what I think we must say too is, okay, $50 today going to Comcast or AT&T or one of Carrie's members is good. I, I think that's a great thing. Give people more ability to afford more robust broadband packages. Mm -hmm. It's not the smartest use of taxpayer or ratepayer money long-term to say, and we don't care what it costs. You know, We just need to be looking at ways to bring down that price through competition, and more choice and subsidy. And you know that's the live question at the end is, is there rate regulation for monopolies in the future? We haven't had that for a while. You know, The United States has been on a very deregulatory path for broadband for a long time. So I wanna take that point that Doug raises head on, but not to say we have the answer for that today, just to say that is part of that conversation is how do we make the service affordable when people sometimes understandably face a natural monopoly? You know, It only makes sense for one provider to go into an area that's why we've had for so long the kinds of rate of return and uh, cost-based incentives for universal service funding at the FCC. And I think that's what I see in a smart and evolved way in the plan, not so much a call to impose rate regulation on providers uh, if they're subject to this money or are somehow taking advantage of the subsidy. All right. So I'll stop there. We've done some research on RDOF as well and happy to talk about that. I know that, that Gary and Carrie have uh, strong feelings about that and, and we do too, but I don't want to belabor the time and want to make sure we get back to questions. Well, let's dive into some of the core questions and I previewed them. I'm kind of giving this a try. So what I was about to ask, I've already told you in the, the chat window. And let me just start with the first one. So Gary, is future proof a synonym for fiber? Why or why not? Carrie also used that phrase but you used it in terms to wireless. So could you kind of uh, get into this question of what you are understanding by the use of the term future-proof in this plan? Gary first. Well, you know, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I was on a call at the White House and uh, Jonathan Adelstein, uh, you know, a wireless proponent was on the call and he seemed to challenge him saying terms like future-proof and, um, you know, uh, long-lasting and, and things there, the language in there all said fiber, which I would agree with. Um, but I think you got to be careful on this because I think we live in an untethered world. And so I think Kerry did a really nice job of describing that fiber infrastructure is critical for wireless. And so we're all going to be Wi-Fi. We're going to be, you know, have our phones and things like that. So we're, we're living in an untethered world, but you have to get that critical infrastructure. And so um, I think the, you know, um, the president is very wise in being able to focus on being able to make sure that we do put a future-proof infrastructure in place and to make sure that we're looking at this long-term. Because one of the things you'll see is, you'll see um, like on the RDOF auction, I think Carrie's um, called it an epic fail. I, I would disagree with that characterization because 85% of the winners were in the gigabit tier and 99.7 were 100 megabits or greater. So I would say um, the jury's still out. You know, we'll see what they do with Elon Musk and a billion dollars going his way. Um, but I do think that you know we're on the right track, but the race to the bottom, I definitely agree with her on you know reverse auctions and so forth, and that forces um, providers when you're only getting one percent of the budget to serve an area 
to try to come up with some ridiculously inexpensive way to try to serve the people that you're committing to. And that's really an epic fail for those communities. And so I think the Biden plan of being able to get a fiber to every um, American is a great plan. You know, I would, it was fingernails in the ch chalkboard when Doug talks about, you're know, really gonna leave 2% of America behind. You know, well, I hope I'm not that 2%, right? Because I think it's really important that all Americans get served. Um, but, but anyway, just to answer your question, absolutely. I think the administration is looking to, let's do this job right, do it once and for all, and then be able to look at all the benefits that's gonna be, and that's gonna be able to get public um, you know, safety, it's gonna be able to get 5G, it's gonna be able to do all those things we need to do to have you know, rural healthcare and online learning and so forth, so. Terry. And I was gonna say, when I'm talking about future-proof from a wireless standpoint, I'm talking about when you get into 5G and what, what comes beyond 5G, um, it's software-based and being able to have equipment that you, when you're changing out the software, you're not go going in and changing out the hardware. Um, so when we get start talking about open radio access networks and, and all kinds of software virtualized networks, that sort of thing from a wireless perspective, that that's a way to future proof those types of networks. I agree that Gary, that you know, eventually the wireless needs wires and we need fiber. Um, but going back to Doug's point, he said 2%. I hope he's talking about geographically and not population wise, because I think 2% of the population is all of rural America, as I recall. I could be off on that, but I'm hoping he's talking about the geography and where we can't reach. Something else I would just remind everybody is these, these companies who have served in the rural areas, um, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say, NTCA's members, your members, Gary, they've done a really good job, but they're not everywhere in the country. And so Biden's trying to solve for those people that are not in those, in, in those areas who don't have access to this, who don't even have probably, you know, copper phone service, because there's still some places that don't have copper phone service, and they're not going to have broadband in those areas. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, and we need to use every tool we can use, whether it's wireless, I think there's going to be a play for satellite here. But the most critical thing to do right now is get those maps right. We don't know what we don't know. And we need the boots on the ground. We need the local communities reporting into some sort of data collection. I mean, we're right now, the, the FCC is relying on the carriers to you know, say where they serve. There's a whole lot, lot of areas that still nobody serves and we don't know those areas. We have carriers who want to serve. We have unserved areas. We need a match.com to try to connect who needs the service and whether it's the municipalities, they're not in the business of building networks, but can they take a grant program and find someone who is and, and, and be the community service provider through a grant program by hiring someone who knows what they're doing. And the other thing I, I sit here and worry about and what keeps me awake at night is we build it, but how do we keep operating it after we build it? I mean, I'm hearing this idea of like, let's not put you know more subsidies towards this. Well, we have 10 billion right now in the universal service fund for operational expenses, as well as CapEx expenses. So, yeah, I mean, and we've been doing that for a long time now. So we need to work on all of that. So future-proofing that means building it and being able to operate it. So that's another you know, term I would look at when I'm talking about future-proofing. I definitely want Doug to get into this. And, 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 and Doug, you mentioned the term tech neutrality, but, but I'm, I'm kind of pushing against that. Why do we need to pretend on neutrality if there is a clearly superior technology that is required, even as an, as an element of wireless, right? I'm not hearing particular disagreement from Carrie on this point that you need to get fiber deep out into the, the community. So, so I mean, Doug, you, you take take us on. Tell us why that's wrong. Why, why you know, we shouldn't be, be be saying, look, fiber, you know, subject to, to proving otherwise that you can get. Um, you know, the, the connectivity speeds, why shouldn't that be the preference? Sure, sure, a couple of thoughts. So first of all, on 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 your question just here recently, I think te technological neutrality to my mind is more a matter of process and where we are in the process of actually getting this money out the door. And to my mind, when we're talking about legislation, when we're talking the plan up front, you wanna build in flexibility for different types of technology to be used in different geographic areas. Sometimes, you know, carries members offering wireless for the last 
you know, a couple thousand feet a mile is going to be the, you know, by far and away the most cost effective technology. If you're talking about mountainous areas or trying to get down into a, a canyon or something like that, right? You want flexibility so we're not locked in at the, at the point of legislation. Uh, when, it, when we're talking about future proofing, uh, so I worry, I think that the, a, a lot of this debate was very heavily influenced by thinking late in the Obama administration that identified cable and fiber as being particularly scalable, particularly easily upgraded without future investments. And this has sort of taken on the role of, of being quote unquote future proof that both cable and fiber can easily be upgraded to, to higher speeds down the road. So I'm in absolute agreement that we need to be moving away from the old sort of models, especially the, the right of first refusal of funding rural broadcast Band, right, where we say build to this speed and we'll, uh, and we'll compensate you this much, right? If we move towards something that's an auction model, we almost certainly will be funding for, for fiber for much of the new deployments in these areas. Otherwise, if you're, if you're building out, you know, uh, you know, extending a cable network, you're, it, what it really means is building fiber deeper into the network and then having cable just for those, for those last few feet. And so I think you want to have flexibility in, in the point of legislation. And then we get down to an auction at the FCC, you can wait the particular bids in the auction to ensure that for, for most of the areas where we're just talking about building down, you know, the last few miles down the road to connect a, a farmland or connect a new rural city, th that will almost certainly be fiber, right? This is what we saw in the RDOP. Almost all the bids ended up being at gigabit tier networks uh, or, or at least 100 megabits per second. But you don't want to lock that in for everywhere for the entire country um, and make it so that so that that's the only option. Uh, you want to ha have all the tools available uh, on the table. So this is a fair point. And, and you know, the, the RDOF, you know, did, did of course, feature, um, you know, getting, getting the speeds up, or at least the promised speeds up, whether they can deliver on that is another question. But let's, let's kind of push back because RDOF tends to sort of favor those who can bid, right, which kind of takes the municipalities out of the picture. And so I'm kind of going to jump to the question three. And I want to actually ask Carrie, why did you say RDOF has been an epic failure. And I'd love, Matt, your perspective on this too. And then what, if it has been a failure or if there were things that were lacking, what should be we, the Biden administration be sure to do differently as it incorporates this new funding for infrastructure? Okay. So from the, the RDOF perspective, a lot of the winners were wireless internet service providers who are very, very small. Um, and they want a lot of money to serve a lot of locations. And the question becomes, are they capable of doing that? When you only have five or six people working for you, I question whether you can build out $900 million worth of infrastructure. I say, I'm not talking about SpaceX. I'm, I'm not talking about Elon Musk. He has the financial wherewithal. There's no question on that. The question for Elon Musk and SpaceX is, does that technology do what it claims to do? It's an unproven technology. So the risk is if you have these wireless providers, and I, and I say this, and I work for a wireless trade association, but if the technology is not able to deliver on the gigabit speeds that they say and claim that they can not do, and it's not proven, and some of them are using millimeter wave technology, which has all kinds of issues with rain and snow and line of sight, that type of thing. Um, if the FCC goes ahead and awards these folks this money, and in four, six years, we find out they haven't been able to do it, then all of these areas go deprived of service because they've gone off the map to be eligible for other funding sources. And so that's why I say it's an epic fail. If the FCC doesn't do its job properly and vet these applicants, and if they award them to applicants who end up failing, we've taken all of those areas in RDOF that are, are I'm, I'm primarily focused on some of the, the big winners who have wireless plays on this then we have a problem um, because those areas aren't eligible for RUS funding. They're not eligible for state grant funding. Um, it pulls them right off the map. And in interest of full disclosure, I do represent ERIC, which is the Ensuring RDOF Integrity Coalition. So, and we've done a lot of filings before the FCC, so I should say that to the audience as well. But that's where we say it's an epic failure that the FCC allowed the, um, the wireless technology to come in and play as if they were delivering gigabit speeds and they're not using fiber to deliver those gigabit speeds because I'm not aware of the technology that can do that. Well, I'd love to ask further, but I wanna get Matt's take on RDOF here. And, and, and more importantly, how do we fix it? If there is a problem, if you agree there's a problem like Carrie is saying, what, what would be, should be done differently? Yeah, I mean, kudos to Carrie. This sounds snarky, but I mean, to get an acronym that has an acronym as part of 
just one of the letters. I mean, that's how much more policy want could you get than that? You know, Epic's failure, we were very critical of RDOF at the end of the last administration because if anybody wants to claim, and I think understandably enough, the now departed Chairman Pai wanted to say, we did it, we're done, we did such a great job. Like if we're gonna say this was the answer to broadband deployment in rural areas, now and going forward, then yeah, on that score, it's an epic failure. I guess where I would try to soften ever so slightly is to say, we're concerned about a lot of things and a lot of waste in the RDOF approach and just uncareful, almost like I told you so kind of stuff where the maps just weren't ready. And what I think we're seeing is that, you know, Carrie and, and Gary have laid this out. We have some concerns about WISPs for sure. I'm not going to say no WISP can build to the speeds they promised, but I am going to say we have questions about, especially ones that are newer and have promised a lot and don't really have the track record there. We might have questions about incumbents who promised a lot and don't have great track records either. Our biggest concern about RDUF was the mismatching in our view on the maps and money going to in, you know, we're not the rural organization, but we have a rural fund. A lot of money went to, when I say a lot, I mean roughly 10%, we think, to census blocks in urban areas. And in either case, urban and rural, what we've seen is just a lot of funny matches, speaking of match.com, where, you know, SpaceX and others got money in urban areas to serve parking lots, highway medians, and cul-de-sacs with nobody in them. I can't tell you why those are separate census blocks, but apparently sometimes they are. And so what we saw is the maps in those cases, not uh, overstating coverage, as is so often in the complaint, but understating it. You know, there are houses all around this cul-de-sac. They all have gigabit speeds or at least high speed service from cable and phone companies. And yet somehow this cul-de-sac was available in the maps to get money. We also saw in rural areas, speaking of overbuilding, this is like somewhat of a different take on overbuilding, but areas that were not quite lit up yet in rural areas, but that had providers coming in. And so now we've seen some cases, we've laid a lot of this out in a, in a series of blog posts that we did where giant incumbents like Charter were in theory gonna get money from RDOF to overbuild CAF2 subsidy winners. Uh, and in some cases, municipal and cooperative networks that got CAF2 money. So you know, I'll stop there. I could, there. There are cases where incumbents also got money to wire a census block across the street from where they're offering service. And there's million dollar homes across the street already getting service. Just a lot of questions about how careful was this? Shouldn't we have waited after all? And, and where is the money flowing based not just on the technology concerns, but on the, the mapping accuracy and the coverage questions and frankly, just the policy questions about how this was done. Well, there's, there's uh, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so first of all, I, I love the way that Carrie and Matt um, lay this out because I think they do a great job. Um, but I, I would say just carry the um, on the epic fail side, the you know, we knew before going into this, right? We knew that we didn't have good broadband maps and you know the FCC made a deliberate decision of trying to get the money out quick and you know it's gonna take time to get maps and we all know that's a huge issue. The other part of this, um, the process was you know the short forms, right? So we allowed people to bid before we knew whether they had the wherewithal to be able to deliver. And so the FCC's process now, you know, they put their long forms on January 29th and they need to, now it's the FCC's job to vet and make sure that those, um, you know, winning bidders can be able to deliver. And so, you know, if I have faith in the process, the FCC will, you know, basically smoke out those, um, for, you know, winning bidders who aren't, don't have the propensity to be able to deliver what they asked for. And, and you know, Leo satellites and things like that. So we're hoping that that gets out. But you know, if we look at how this is gonna fit into the process for the Biden administration, I, I think Kerry's right on the money is you know, kind of what we saw with the reverse auction, it's a race to the bottom where you know, you, you know, instead of being able to you know, look at it, we had $16 billion and we left $7 billion on the sideline, right? And instead of being able to give that, you know, you know, um, Elon Musk you know, $900 million to, you know, basically strand that investment space, we could have taken that $7 billion, put that towards that area and been able to get the right infrastructure to those, you know, those at rural America. Um, you know, I also, so I think it's, you know, if I look at like the um, uh, Klobuchar um, Clyburn bill and even what they tried to do in the last Congress, you know, what they were looking, you know, said, hey, they were trying to preempt um, art off by being able to say, okay, all your fiber ready projects, let's take that out of the auction, go ahead and get that funded. And then the auction will be uh, focused on, you know, the non-fiber projects. Um, in their current bill, um, what they're looking at is to be able to, um, you know, do the same. Let's get, you know, let's 
ferret out those, you know, fiber projects and the no brainers and get those going. So I think that, you know, we need to be able to have kind of that two step approach to be able to make sure that when we get this money out, you know, we are able to vet these projects and be able to do, you know, the fire ready ones go ahead and then put more scrutiny on the ones that look a little more suspicious. We have a huge number of questions in our discussion. Keep it coming. I'm going to kind of piggyback on two early on a little bit, but one by Anderson Walworth, who says that the large providers are somewhat the cause of the lack of equity and access for underserved and unserved communities. Doug says we need to leverage large providers instead of relying on municipalities and collectives. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And the very next one is from Re Rebecca Landry says, using municipalities only makes sense for some municipalities. Many do not have access to utility poles and cannot entice fiber or ISP service providers. In those cases, they are not suited for or interested in being the installer ISP. Let's get some reactions to both those comments, starting with you, Doug. Sure, yeah. I, as I mentioned, I mean, I, I think that municipalities, uh, rural cooperatives, things like that, they, they can be excellent gap fillers, uh, you know, particularly in those areas that are especially costly to serve, you know, difficult for, for either population density or, or, or other reasons. Uh, but I just don't think that they scale well, right? And I want to see this program devoted to uh, taking on those areas that the private sector is not interested in serving and nicely complementing what I think works well as a, as a, as a pretty good engine for, for investment and innovation. Uh, I think it's true that a lot of municipalities, when they look at the economics, um, especially where, where they're already served by, by um, you know, two uh, fairly robust providers, uh, the economics just don't make a lot of sense for them to be entering those sorts of markets. And so I do think that, uh, that uh, a lot of uh, municipalities uh, um, uh, you know, aren't interested in necessarily entering this uh, 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 in a big way. Um, on, the, on the point of scale, I, so I, 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 there, there's, I think it's important that we set up the, uh, a potential auction so should we get um, uh, interest and participation from, from providers of all different sizes, right? Uh, we want small, medium, and large. I do think that there are ways in which past programs have particularly benefited relatively small rural um, ILEX in particular um, and, and, is, and have not always uh, uh, encouraged or, uh, or seeing uh, sort of some of the red tape removed that, that make more sense for those smaller providers and less sense for, for large providers. So I do think that uh, to the extent we're talking about uh, previous support programs, there has not always been a good incentive for large providers to participate. And so I think that if we you know, take a fresh look at this um, uh, and uh, you know, structure an auction in a way that, that makes sense for, for everyone to participate and potentially extend their network, that, uh, that some of the large providers with, with big economies of scale can successfully extend their network, um, you know, even if it's just you know, broadening the footprint out uh, marginally, that, that takes a, um, takes a large Large, uh, large chunk off the table. Who else wants to address this? I, I, I oh. just feel we haven't really talked this through enough because there's, there's, uh, you know, art off in a way is is kind of all private, right? Uh, I guess co-ops can participate too, and the, the the language of the administration specifically talks to the role of municipalities and co-ops, and so I'd really like kind of some more perspectives yeah. on is that wise or not wise, Matt? Yeah, no, I mean that's. I think it is wise for the language to do that. And again, referring to what Carrie said earlier, we see that in, in some of the current packages out there too, the Lift America Act and the, the Clyburn. This is a, I'm talking about acronyms too much today, but AAIA is a, a tough one for me to spit out sometimes, but it's a great bill. Um, you know, I would, I would push back on what Doug said in some places for sure. I wouldn't say just gap fillers. I don't, I don't know that nationwide scaling is necessary in order to be a productive local or regional service provider, if that's what we're talking about. And in some cases, these gaps are, you know, not all that recent, you know, we're talking 20, 30, 40 years of history of private investment just not coming. I mentioned before, since it's public and in our blog post, it's actually one of our founding members who's still with Free Press, who basically helped to build a broadband network serving 22 towns in not quite the Berkshires, but, you know, that central to Western part of Massachusetts. So more than a gap, sort of a long suffering area that just wasn't getting investment. But I think the thing I want to say is at the end, you know, to the question asked about munis in the first place, kind of one word answer is yes, like it's not going to work for every community. I think even the staunchest advocates for municipal broadband have said, you talk about like Chris Mitchell and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is such a leader in this space. Let communities make those choices on their own. And what we've seen and what we've fought against so often is states coming in and saying, you don't have that choice on the table. You know, we're going to make that decision for you here at the state legislature. 
with frankly a lot of input from incumbents who are obviously have a bottom line interest in keeping out municipal and cooperative solutions. Gary, let me let me ask you to focus on this question. That is to say, you know, some groups have come out very strongly against the administration's proposal. For example, NCTA, the Cable Association, very strong against, and and others had maybe a little less strong, but but still cautious. Whereas I read your statement extremely positive, and yet you represent private companies, uh, Gary. C could you just speak to this issue of of private versus public as it comes to fiber and fiber building? You're on mute, Gary, so you have to make sure to unmute. Yeah, no, so just to kind of, I haven't really come across um, a utility or a municipality that says, man, we just want to get into broadband. That's, you know, what we want to do as our community is, you know, learn how to become a service provider. Uh, they all have got jumped in because of necessity, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think that the way we're going to end up is I don't think you're going to just take $100 billion and sit there and, and, and try to pump it to every municipality across the nation. I think what you're going to see is I think the message is what you've got to read out of this. And the message by the administration is serve every member of that community. And so where, you know, we've seen in the past where some incumbents have cherry picked, um, that's what we're trying to avoid in this, you know, at least my interpretation is. And so I think, um, where you know, we've seen some very, very successful municipal um, networks. We've seen, you know, I think one of your sponsors is Utopia Fiber. You know, they've got up to 15, 20 communities now. Um, one of, you know, I mentioned um, Chattanooga, EPB, the utility there. I'm sitting on um, municipal broadband from Huntsville Utilities, you know, provided by Google. So I think there's a lot of really great um, um, opportunities for, you know, really great broadband from, you know, utilities and municipalities. That said, there's a reason why, you know, these some incumbents have been in business for 100 years. And, you know, I, I don't think there's no substitute for experience and having qualified professionals that know how to deploy broadband and do a good job. I think what it does is it puts pressure on those incumbents to say, I got to serve everybody and I got to do a good job doing that. Or I'm, you know, the alternative is someone's going to do it for me and that money is available to do that. So I, I think it's putting pressure in the right place. Um, our members are excited. You know, if we look at the overall investment, you know, this 2021 is going to be the largest fiber investment year in history. And we're just at the beginning if you look at, you know, what's projected over the next several years with all the money coming out. So, so uh, perhaps we can wrap into this issue of speeds because it, it, it is sort of maybe lurking in, in the discussion. And, and some of the bills, the... Uh, um, um, AAIA, uh, 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 affordable broadband, accessible and affordable broadband for everyone, uh, it does have a, a hundred hundred um, up, up, upstream downstream requirement, which is obviously very different from what the current standard is 25, three, 25 megabits down, three megabits up, which in my view is inadequate. But, but actually, you know, the early rounds of CAF2, Connect America Fund, had 10 megabits down, one megabit up. And so, so I want to kind of pose to each of you the question of what's wrong with overbuilding 10-1 or 25-3? Well, I mean, isn't that really the responsibility of the administration to say, if we're really going to get good quality future-proof broadband, we have to kind of say we're not going to stand for a 25-3 or maybe even 25-25 broadband. So I definitely want to get your opinions. I know we're not going to be all on the same perspective here, but but what, what are your thoughts on how speeds should factor into this approach? Let's get everyone in, Doug first. Sure, yeah, so uh, I mean, speeds are important in a couple of different ways, but I think the most important is uh, right defining what counts as underserved, right? And so right now, as you mentioned, 25.3 is where we're at. I, I think that that's a reasonable floor. It's super practical in coordinating with existing uh, existing programs. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we, we take some of the lessons learned from RDOF and, and uh, you know, another auction in the future is better structured, has more sort of technocratic controls built in up front. But, it, but an auction all but guarantees that you get significantly higher speeds when you're building up past 25.3. It just gives you that flexibility for the, the rare areas that, that need it. Uh, part of what concerns me is, is I don't see a lot of the conversations around future proofing and these extremely high levels of you know, 100, 100 or, or even a gigabit symmetrical. I don't see that tied to 
a sort of reasonable discussion of what applications actually require. It's just sort of this assumption that, you know, we've been on this exponential curve in the growth of demand for broadband speed so far, and we just assume that that's going to continue forever. For my research, I mean, the, the growth in demand for broadband speed is, has so far today been very closely tied to the growth in video resolution. 85% of, of traffic on the internet is video. We're very quickly approaching the speeds at which we can and stream video that is uh, as high resolution as can as the human eye can perceive. Screen sizes are generally getting smaller, not larger. There's all sorts of innovation taking place on uh, around video compression algorithms. That's a very rich area of research. And so I think that it's reasonable to, to assume that, you know, like almost all of the growth curves that we see in nature, economics and society, it goes up for very quickly for a short period of time and then eventually it plateaus and levels out. And so I don't, I know that it's popular to just sort of assume for sort of safety well, reasons. I mean, Doug, Doug, just forever. Just, but. just to push back a little bit. I mean, the pandemic shows three up is not sufficient, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't want a three up connection. And that, and so I, again, I've sort of long now advocated, let's multiply the, uh, you know, download by upload to get our speed score rather than uh, implicitly adding them together. So that would at least argue for 25, 25, if not 100, 100. But let's get Matt and Gary and Carrie's perspective on this too. Um, I would, I'll just step up to the plate here <laughs> to say that um, I think we don't know. We can't, I mean, when we talk about future proof, we don't know what's going to be in the future. So I think if you can build networks that you can build symmetrically um, and the 100, 100 may be the right number to target, but you've got to be able to also use technology and software to adjust. So maybe at some point you need a lot more down, a lot more up, but you build the network in that way so the capacity can change up and down. And we're not just talking about speed, we're talking about latency as well. And I think about our applications, our internet of things applications out in rural America, and to be able to see the video coming in of the farmland and what's going on with the plants while the farmer's out at the beach, checking his phone on his crops, that's the future. That's what we start talking about when we start talking about precision agriculture, was a, which is part of the whole funding for the 5G rural fund that we haven't even had a chance to dive into as well. But um, those are the things that I think of. So I don't think that we should limit ourselves. I think we need to build networks, think about the networks of the future, what they're going to be doing and build them so that they can, they can morph. And that, that idea of morphing would, would be something that I would like to see introduced in all of this. Let's, let's hear from uh, Matt and, and Gary, and we will have to make these your, your, your closing thoughts on this, but you know, this plus other, other perspectives you have, Matt. Yeah, I mean, again, I, 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 as I said before, I don't think we should be giving federal money to incumbents to overbuild municipal networks. I mean, we're not so intent on overbuilding that all overbuilding is something we should be subsidizing. But what I will say is, for one thing, when I read the statute, it talks about comparable services in urban and rural areas. And so if I'm gonna to go to a rural area and say, well, you get one choice and people in an urban area get two or three, that doesn't feel comfortable to me. And I think to Doug's earlier point too about how do we actually control for rates and prices, you know, subsidizing competition so that we actually have people having a choice may in fact be a smart economic choice. So there's that point. And I don't wanna say yes, overbuild everywhere all the time because there are some economics in play here about network return on investment, but we need to not be treating it like some kind of third rail. And the only thing I would say about the speeds too is that, you know, when chairman, former chairman Wheeler testified and you had Commissioner O'Reilly on the other side, you know, I will maybe for the first time in a while at least say, I, I agree in some part with Commissioner O'Reilly. I wouldn't say that today's speeds are unusable, although sitting here at home as I am with three kids, you know, everybody doing Zoom upload at the same time. Yeah, three megabits per second is not gonna cut it. Where I will again, quickly part ways with Commissioner O'Reilly is not to think that somehow 100, 100 is exorbitant, I think was a word that he used. I mean, as Carrie said so well, we don't know what everything is going to hold in the future. And so to say, oh, that's too much speed for you people, like, no, we, we shouldn't make those kinds of choices on people's behalf, especially without some humility about how technology will develop. Well, thank you. Uh, Gary, you're going to get the last word in this conversation. What, what would you like us to take, take away from, from this discussion of the Biden plan? Well, first of all, um, your panelists are awesome. I've enjoyed listening to everyone and I really appreciate their perspectives. Um, so the, you know, I just, you know, Matt's talking about the, um, some of the testimony that's been saying, oh, 25, three is good enough. And it reminds me of the old tobacco hearings we used to have, right? Where all the tobacco guys got and said, 
tobacco doesn't cause cancer, right? 25.3 is good enough for everybody. But I think it really comes down to Matt's opening comments, his little talk about digital equity. And, you know, the reason we have these symmetric, asymmetric rates is because, you know, the internet initially came over a phone, phone line and we could only be able to get so much bandwidth over, you know, the voice band. And so we did it asymmetric. Well, that's no longer a problem. We have the technology. I mean, Kerry talked about, you know, being able to have software enabled networks and be able to have future proof. So I think it's ridiculous to talk about speeds, you know, three megabits being good enough for 25. I and mean, we saw that the national broadband plan was predicated on one megabit a decade ago. So being able to have symmetric is a no brainer. You know, there's no reason. And it, it's definitely ridiculous to make someone be left behind because where they live. So I would just say that, you know, we're really excited about what the president's, you know, the direction of his plan. There's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, thank you for having us. Well, and thank you to each of you. Before I, I, I close out and thank our, our speakers, I want to thank our sponsors, Utopia Fiber, STL Network Services, and Broadband Now. Remind you that next week on April 14th, uh, 12 noon Eastern time, every Wednesday, we'll be talking about uh, funding for your broadband project. And uh, I want to thank each of you. You've put so many comments in here. We, we can't respond to all of them. Perhaps we'll be able to reach out to you, some of, some of you uh, offline, but uh, pl please uh, let others know about this event. And on behalf of our three panelists, or four panelists, uh, uh, Doug Brake of ITIF, Gary Bolton of Fiber Broadband Association, Matt Wood of Free Press, and Kerry Bennett of Rural Wireless Association. I'm Drew Clark, Broadband Breakfast. We'll see you next Wednesday at 12 noon.